sure by this stage of the weekend you you know me so far uh, Ruben 24 and I work for the faith mission here in Balamina hopefully you've been enjoying the weekend so far for the teaching that we've heard and uh, that is uh, both a challenge and encouragement to us that you could apply into your life just want to take a few minutes to share my own life story of where I was uh, before God entered my life and where I am now on the opportunities that he has given to me. I just want to open with a, a verse from the Bible that's really been on my mind when thinking on my testimony, even in my own personal devotions over the last few weeks. It's found in the Psalms. Uh, I just love reading the Psalms. And this is Psalm 22 uh, and verse 22. Easy to remember. Psalm 22, verse 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. It's great that I can stand here today and maybe you can say this as well, that you have a testimony, a testimony of what Jesus did in your life, of how he saved you by his grace and made you a child of God. I can sing praises today because I know I'm going to heaven to be with my Savior one day and I can serve him today as a Christian. From a very young age, I was brought up in a Christian home. My mother and father, they work for the faith mission as well. They're involved with church work for uh, a while as well. So I was involved uh, in anything. I was brought along to Bible class, Sunday school, whatever was on, I was there, whether I, whether I liked it or not. Often I, had my, often I had thoughts in my head of 
this is the last place I ever want to be, it's the last place I ever want to end up and uh, lo and behold here I am. So uh, it's amazing how things actually do work out. But uh, yeah, I went through um, all those different things. I went, so I had a great understanding of the Bible, of what I thought at that time. Uh, I knew all the stories, whether it was Jonah and the big, big fish or whether it was Noah and the ark. Uh, I knew all those stories, but it was just kind of surface knowledge. And there was nothing deeper to it at than that. I knew that I needed to be um, saved by God. I knew I needed to ask Jesus in my heart um, to forgive me of my sins. I knew the punishment he paid on the cross, but uh, nothing was ever done in my own heart on that matter. It wasn't until about the age of six or seven, still you could say relatively young, uh, we would often go on holidays down to County Cork where uh, my mum's side of the family lived, so we went to see all the aunties, all the uncles and the cousins, and it was always a time that we looked forward to um, every year, just going on the farm and having uh, a bit of crack there. And it came to one Sunday morning, we were at our, our, we were at our cousin's church, and the speaker there was speaking on the topic of heaven and hell. And as a young boy, you often think, oh, I'm just gonna sail through life, I'll get the right job, I'll get the, the, right, the, the right wage packet, I'll find myself a wife, I'll have children, I'll get a nice house, uh, and that'll do me just fine. I'll just do what everybody else does. Uh, but that was not uh, what needed to be done in my life. I heard of heaven and hell, of the consequences of my sin, and where I would be going if I did not make uh, a commitment to the Lord Jesus. So it was that day that God really convicted me uh, of where I stood with him. That night I knelt next to my bed and uh, asked my mum to help me and I asked the Lord Jesus into uh, my life, a decision I do not regret and I look, for, I look fondly back uh, upon every day. And I trust that if you're viewing and you say today that you are a child of God, you're a Christian, you can uh, say I've had that same experience Ruben that you had then that's an amazing thing and I trust you don't regret it, that you look fondly back towards it and use it as an opportunity to share with friends, with family and those uh, that you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I can't say that at, at that age of six that once that day had passed that my life changed astronomically. Uh, I went back, to uh, all the primary school things, went into secondary school uh, and just seemed to go by the paces, just trying to get on with life and not doing uh, anything too extravagant. And it came to about the age of 15. Uh, during secondary school, I started to go down a very uh, dangerous and slippery slope of temptation uh, and of sin, something I hid from my family for a number of years, uh, hid from many people in my own church. And uh, safe to say, I'm ashamed of uh, some of the things that I did, uh, of really giving into the desires of uh, my own flesh and what the devil uh, wanted me to partake in, forgetting uh, completely that I was supposed to be a Christian that I was supposed to be following God, but I was following the world and what they wanted for me. And it was about the age of 15, as I was saying, there was weeks and they, you could probably even say months that went by where I was going to bed crying and not really understanding, knowing what was happening. And it was during these moments that God really began to speak to me and say that, Ruben, you're not where you should be in your relationship with me. You're falling away, you're backsliding, and I'm here to draw you back to my side and show you that you are to live a life committed to your Savior. So it was at that night I woke my father up just after midnight, and as some of you know him, he loves to sleep. And so he wasn't too happy at first when I woke him up, but when I told him, he was so happy and pleased. So it was that night I didn't ask Jesus into my heart again. I simply recommitted my life to God and says, Jesus, whatever you have planned for me in life, I'm going to follow your path. No matter what I may think is the best idea, I'm going to follow your path. Went through the remainder of secondary school, did a couple of courses in cooking, went back to do A-levels, uh, flunked a few exams and kind of at a crossroads in my life. Uh, God led me to the work of the Faith Mission Bookshops where I served uh, for two years really having good opportunities to speak into people's lives, whether they were looking for a Bible, uh, a, a Christian book that uh, for a, an issue that they're dealing with in the relationship with Jesus. So uh, there was really good opportunities for me there uh, when I spent working at the bookshop over in Belfast for two years. But I knew um, my, my mind was always drawn back to that very evening, to that um, quarter past midnight or whatever day of the week it was that um, I recommitted my life to God and I said, God, whatever you have planned, um, use me and I will go. 
and it was during um, it was about the autumn of 2017 if I'm getting uh, the year right that I uh, applied for the Faith Mission Bible College I started studying there and uh, after those two years of, of learning uh, of growing and loving the Lord Jesus that he called me uh, to work with the Faith Mission same organization that Johnny and Amy uh, and others here work for as well so got, I've been in, in my personal eyes I've been in somewhat of a roller coaster perhaps you could say um, you, you find yourself in a similar position to myself that you've grown up in a Christian family that you've done things that you regret that perhaps people don't even know about but you find yourself here and um, back uh, on great terms and solid footing and um, with the Lord or perhaps you're viewing and you, you, you just don't know where you are with God and you're just uh, making all these mistakes uh, day after day. I just want to read one quote to you from uh, a famous evangelist, a famous preacher, Billy Graham. Billy Graham said these words, The unbelieving world should see our testimony lived out daily because it just may point them to the Saviour. So if you are viewing uh, this short video, and hopefully I haven't been too long, that uh, when you look to the outside world, what do they see in you? Do they just see another ordinary individual seeking to just go through the paces of life, making a few mistakes and fixing those mistakes themselves when the time comes to it? Or do they see a child of God? Do they see a Christian who is ready to um, witness to them? That if you see someone on a train, someone on a bus, or even in the library, wherever it is, that you would take that opportunity to share with them uh, the good news of the gospel, of what Jesus did in your life, that you would have and really that joy in your heart to share that with other people. If you're not a Christian and you don't have a testimony, I'm sure you know a uh, Christian, you know all of us here, and there's many of us here that have testimonies. We would love to share our testimony with you uh, of what Jesus has done um, for us, and we would seek that he would do that for you as well. That's really the point um, of this weekend, really the point of these life stories to teach you uh, of what the Lord has done for you, and what he can do for you and that you would make those steps to trust in him and to live for him each day and know that you are a new creation and that you are a child of God. Hopefully I haven't uh, rambled on for too long and that will have made uh, some sense to you that God will be speaking into your life and uh, you'll be able to say today uh, that I do have a testimony. I am a child of God and I have a real joy and peace in my heart because of this. Thank you. The goal of our program here at the Faith Mission Bible College is to provide a framework in which Christians can grow as able communicators, as competent leaders, and as mature believers to serve the church today. To do this, our program has two elements. We offer 120 credits of academic theology in which biblical, systematic, historical, and practical theology all are covered. But alongside this, we also have courses in mission and ministry which develop more practical skills for serving the church today. But our hope is that we integrate these two elements so that our academic courses feed the spirit and that our practical courses challenge the mind. Altogether, we're excited about what this program can do to help Christians grow in service for God and the church today. When we came to Bible College, we had lots of concerns in our hearts. We worried about the children, we worried about um, what we would do with our house and what we would do with work. But the words of Matthew 19.26 really spoke to us where it says what seems impossible with man is possible with God. And uh, just in them weeks and months God um, undertook for us and we made all things possible. Coming to college at the start uh, was quite a challenge because we were juggling studies and family life. But as the time went on and we got into a routine, we've really enjoyed being here. Our course at the Faith Mission Bible College is unique in that it has three dimensions to it. First of all, it's biblical. Scripture is at the heart of everything that we do and teach here. Everything that you would expect to find in a theological course or a Bible college course is included in our program. Lectures at the college are definitely very challenging. They help uh, for us to actually 
read the Bible properly, not just to read it at face value, but to understand uh, the context in which it was written. And we also have lectures surrounding the history of Christianity and how Christianity uh, kind of came about and grew. But most important, the lectures are very useful for uh, personal gain and understanding how the Bible was written and how it applies to our own lives and tell people whether that's preaching, whether that is through personal one-on-one -on -one evangelism or even out in the streets. It's very useful to see how the Bible is written and how we can take that into the world and reach people with the gospel. Secondly, our course is practical. We give students an opportunity to hone and develop the gifts that God has given to them. And throughout the year, there's a variety of opportunities to be involved in ministry and mission. So on Thursday afternoons we go out to the streets of Edinburgh and we go and share the gospel with people. All what we learn in the classrooms, we apply it and we can share it to people. And you learn so much from those times. And then also we, on placement we, ha we go and work with some faith mission workers and we can apply what we learn in the classrooms into the real world, into real scenarios and situations. Life at college provides a really good fun family atmosphere Everyone's so approachable and all-inclusive. There's always someone to chat to and have fellowship with or play games with even. Living with each other does come with its struggles, but overall it's all part of our sanctification and it's a really happy place to be. Thirdly, our course is spiritual. We want students to grow in their relationship with the Lord and we want them to become more like Jesus in the way that they talk and live. I would encourage anyone who is searching for purpose in their life to seek first the Kingdom of God. That's where you'll find the answers for all life's big and small questions. As you draw near to the throne of grace, surrendering all, getting to know your King's heart more, you'll find that His will for your life will start to unfold. And who knows, He might just send you to Bible College.
Okay, so now we come to love. And uh, love is one of those words that is overused and uh, is really quite hard to define, at least in our culture. Now, I wonder tonight how you would define love and what it is. When a group of children were asked this very question, here are some of the answers that they gave. Rebecca, age eight, said this. Love is when my grandmother got her arthritis. She couldn't bend over to paint her toenails anymore, so my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis. Two, that's love. Someone else, little Billy, age four, says this. When someone loves you, the way that they say your name is different. You just know that your name is safe in their mouth. Another little girl, Elaine, age five, says this. Love is when mummy gives daddy the best piece of chicken. Now, in one breath, we might use the word love to describe how, we, how our sentiment towards our parents or our siblings or our children. And in the next breath, we may use the very same word to claim how we love pancakes or how we love Marvel movies. Anytime faith, hope and love, these three virtues are mentioned together either in 1 Corinthians 13 or 1 Thessalonians 1 or Colossians 1 verse 4. The mention of love is always a reference to how we are to love one another, how we treat each other. So what is, what is love and what do we think it is? Well, what is love? First of all, the version of love that we are spoon-fed through our media um, and through mainstream music and uh, movies, etc., is one of a, a sentimental, sentimental basis and is very much based on our feelings, it is based upon ourselves, and it's seen quite often as something that we are just victims of. You've heard it said, you can't help who you fall in love with, and that's a bit of a mantra. Now, a lady who, her name is, is Deborah uh, Annapol, uh, in her book, The Seven Natural Laws of Love, this is how she describes it in one extract. She said, love is a force of nature. However much may we may want to, we cannot command, demand, or take away love any more than we can command the moon and the stars and the wind and the rain to come and go according to our whims. Love is perceived as being something that is stirring feelings or irrational acts, something that can fade as quickly as it comes. But that is not a biblical understanding of love. The biblical understanding of love is, is somewhat different to our contemporary usage of it. Now, in our English language, we just have one word, and it's love. Uh, but that is quite different uh, in the original language in, the, in which the Bible was written. Now, I'm not going to give you a Greek lesson. I wouldn't try to. I'll let you do that in your own time. But in the Greek language, there are four words, at least four words, allowing those who are speaking about the, the various things, various aspects of what we term as love, uh, to be a little bit more specific in what they're meaning, and therefore eliminating any misunderstanding that we in our English language often find ourselves in. For example, the love that we know as a physical attraction, between a man and a woman on a sexual level, there's a word for that that is unrelated to the word, uh, any of the other three aspects or the word that we describe as love. There's another Greek word which relates to romantic affection or even friendliness and the kind of warm affection that comes uh, between two people when they become close that is a part from any sexual attraction whatsoever. But the word that is used here and the word that is used predominantly in the New Testament 
Right? And all of the, the new, most of the New Testament writing is the highest kind of love. It is a word that simply means the ultimate act of sacrifice for the good of someone else. In fact, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1 could be translated like this. If you speak with the tongues of men and have not the spirit of sacrifice, I am nothing. On August 16th, 1987, on a North West airline flight 225 crashed taking off from the Detroit airport now all the 155 people who were on board uh, were killed except for one one little girl uh, survived uh, her she was four years old she was from uh, Arizona her name was Cecilia when the rescuers came to the crash site uh, to investigate, they first of all assumed that Cecilia had been a passenger in one of the cars uh, where, on the highway where the, the plane had come down. But when they checked the register of the flight, they realized that in fact she was a passenger on board uh, flight 225. Now the reason why Cecilia survived was because as the plane was falling from the sky, Cecilia's mother unlocked, unbuckled her, her own seatbelt, got on her hands and knees uh, in front of her little daughter, wrapped her arms around her, her body around her, and would not let her go. You see, there was nothing that could separate that child from her parents, from her parents' love. Not tragedy, not disaster. Neither the, fall, the, the plane as it fell from the sky or the flames that engulfed it, neither height nor depth nor anything else. And from that act of sacrifice, that little girl, Cecilia, her life was saved and she was preserved. That was the ultimate act of sacrifice. Now, sacrifice in our vocabulary is a dirty word. It makes us squirm in our seats because it cuts across our very instinct to uh, gain what our own selfish uh, desires want. And uh, it hinders me, sacrifice hinders me getting what I feel is rightfully mine. We prefer the word satisfaction, don't we? And we make satisfaction our quest. In our careers, we pursue something that will satisfy. In our relationships, we're encouraged to seek satisfaction. Sacrifice, in fact, has become a, a bit of a forgotten virtue. But this is what Paul is meaning in, when he's writing in Ephesians chapter 5. When he says to the husbands, love your wives. Now, he wasn't meaning be romantic, though you should. He wasn't meaning buy your flowers, which is a good thing. Uh, he wasn't even talking about the shiver in your liver that you feel when you see your woman across a crowded room. But he's talking about something more. He's talking about that spirit of self-sacrifice toward them, that inconveniencing of yourself for their benefit, laying down your life for their good. You see, that's what Jesus was meaning when he said on the Sermon on, on the Mount to love your enemies. What did he mean by love your enemies? He isn't saying conjure up warm sentimental feelings. In fact, he goes on to explain exactly what he means by saying, love your enemies. He goes on and he says, do good to those who persecute you. You see, this love by biblical definition is an act of self-sacrifice towards somebody who does not necessarily, although they may, but not necessarily care for you emotionally. Love your enemies does not mean feel romantic about them. 
Uh, doesn't mean have warm, fluffy feelings about them. Have a happy relationship with them. It means that you do good to even those who persecute you. What does it mean for, to, to, to make an act of self-sacrifice on the behalf of your enemy? Jesus says, do good to those who persecute you. He goes on to give the reason why, and he says this, and this is key, in order that you may be like your father who is in heaven. In other words, love your enemies because God loved his enemies. God loved his enemies enough that he laid down the life of his only holy son that we might live. 1 John chapter 4 verse 10 says this, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and that he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, love by biblical definition is an attitude of selfishness. You see, biblical love is, is not a matter uh, of emotion, but it's a matter of your will. Though feelings often accompany those very things like that uh, mother loved in every sense, emotionally and sacrificially her daughter, that she gave herself God's loving the world was not a matter of feelings. It resulted in him sending his son to redeem the world. You see, love is always selfless and always giving. It is the very nature and substance of love to deny self and to give to others. Little question. I wonder this evening, as you sit in front of your screen and watch this, I wonder how selfless or how selfish those around you might describe you. There's the importance of love. Uh, why, is it, why is this given such a pedestal, this aspect of, of love, this virtue of love? You see, for one, it confirms that our faith is the real deal. When Paul is writing to the Colossians and when he's writing to the Thessalonians and, and to other different churches, Paul always gives thanks for the love that they have for one another. See, what did that mean? See, it told Paul that their faith was the real deal. In 1 John 2 verse 9, John says this, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. If someone is claiming to love God and hates their brother or doesn't love their brother, do you know, they are still in darkness. The absence of love ought to call us to question whether or not we are actually in the household of faith, whether or not we are true believers. And a faith that resides in Christ, and we were the, the trio or faith, hope and love, but a faith that resides in Christ and a love for others are twins that walk together in life. You see, this love should be in the believer, should be in the Christian, should be in you if you're a believer, should be in me if I'm a believer, and I am. But this love grows throughout the course of our life, grows in maturity, grows and develops in the knowledge and in the love of God. You see, the opposite to this love that, is, that Paul speaks of here, the opposite is not hate. The opposite is not hate. But the opposite to this kind of love is selfishness. Married couples, we hear the, in, uh, the divorce rates. Why did you, um, why did you divorce? Uh, we fell out of love is quite often a statement that we reach for. But you see, married couples don't fall out of love. They opt out of love. They choose selfishness over self-sacrifice. And this absence of love ushers in the presence of sin 
The absence of love has nothing to do with our circumstances. If you are unloving today, it's nothing to do with your circumstances. You see, we could have the best of circumstances and still be self-absorbed. We could be in the worst of circumstances and be full of love and self-sacrifice. You see, sin and love are enemies because sin and God are enemies. You see, they cannot coexist at the same time. This loveless life is an ungodly, sad, and sorrowful life. But the godly life is a serving life, a caring life, a tender-hearted life, uh, an affectionate life, self-giving, self-sacrificing. It's the life of Christ living through the believer. You see, the other reason why our faith is 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 uh, love is, is so important it is because it is a witness to a non-christian world it's a witness it's our greatest witness to a non-christian world apologetics uh, is is the very meaning of the word is that of giving a defense for the faith and i love this and I love to watch debates and people can be very impressive as they uh, take the, 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 the Christian faith into the public arena and uh, debate someone who is an agnostic uh, uh, or um, atheist or, or something of, of the like. And the self-cancelling, the self-cancelling worldview is, is challenged in the public forum. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing and it's an exciting thing to watch. But according to Jesus, in, in, in John chapter 17, in his prayer, where he prays for believers who, will, who are yet to come, that is, those of us, even in the 21st century, who have believed and, and everyone since and everyone uh, who will yet uh, believe, Jesus prays for the community of believers that is, he, as he describes, the, uh, the most convincing argument that Jesus is authentic and he has been sent by God the Father. We are the most convincing argument in a world that is gone mad, that Jesus is authentic and Jesus is the only way of salvation. Now, unlike other associations or clubs which may be based upon a, a common interest, the church, that is the, the body of, of believers, is marked by inclusiveness, which echoes the universal appeal of, of Jesus. Now, I, would, um, I would imagine that if I attended the local bowling club, when really I'm an enthusiastic footballer, I might get some strange looks and uh, maybe ask the question, uh, you're a footballer, why are you here? This is a bowling club. Um, but the community of believers, the community of Christians, is to be marked as a community that welcomes all people irrespective of background, irrespective of age, irrespective of gender, moral history, social status, influence, intelligence, uh, religious background, or even the lack of it. The Christian community is to be warm and welcoming and to love as Jesus loved. You see, to love like Jesus Loved is to love unconditionally, is to love without a, a discrimination and to show impartiality. We can either consciously or subconsciously uh, put people in different classes and uh, essentially that is to say you matter, you don't. And we do that in our minds. Uh, sometimes when, when a young couple are dating, uh, someone will say, um, she could do better, or um, I don't know what he sees in her. In, and uh, in such statements, these things are implied that, uh, that, sh that they should be loved or could be loved uh, on the basis of their appearance, etc. 
And we understand sometimes that there are personalities that clash and we understand that there are sometimes uh, people might rightly say, why is she with him or why is he with her? Do they not know what he's like or what she is like? But when this kind of love, this sacrificial love is evident, this disposition of the heart to seek the welfare and to meet the needs of others, the world will take notice. They, the world will take notice that we have been with Jesus. In, late, in the twen- late in the second century, Tertullian, one of the early church leaders, reported the comments of the non-Christians in his day. And this is what they said often. Behold how these Christians love each other. How readily they will die for each other. And their mutual love was magnetic, which drew, mil- which drew pagans, uh, non-Christians, multitudes of them to Christ. And today, this has the same potential. If we'll set aside our personalities, if we'll set aside our squabbles, if we will set aside our secondary issues and love one another, As Christ loved us. Now there's the model of of love. Now this chapter, chapter um, 1 Corinthians 13 and and, uh, the whole chapter is all about love and love's truest form. In fact it's the chapter that is most read at, uh, at weddings. Some have rightly summarized this chapter by saying this. Joy is love rejoicing. Peace is love at rest. Patience is love waiting. Kindness is love interacting. Goodness is love initiating. Faithfulness is love keeping its word. Gentleness is love empathizing. And self-control is love resisting temptation. Jesus is exhibit A when it comes to love. The best known chapter in all of the scriptures, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, exemplifies, is exemplified by Jesus. You see, we could replace the word love with the word Jesus, and it would be every bit as true. Love is patient. Love is kind. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. He, is, he does not envy, he does not boast, he is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. We could say Jesus does not dishonor others, Jesus is not self-seeking. Jesus is not easily angered. One passage of scripture that best illustrates this love that Christ displays is found in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 to 11. And Paul, in speaking to these people, who are a little bit fractured in their relationships with one another. And yes, they're showing love, but they could be doing better. He says this, In your relationships with one another, have the mindset of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking himself By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Putting it bluntly, Jesus willingly leaves the worship and the praise of angels, not using his his position as the pinnacle of heaven. And he leaves it and exchanges the worship and the praise of angels 
and doing that which is unthinkable by exchanging it for the hatred of men. Why? Not for his own advantage, but for our pardon and for our eternal salvation. If ever there's a word that I hate being used in my home is this, Bagsy, Bagsy, I hate it. Now, Bagsy isn't a word that I use in, in my vocabulary, but I'm very familiar with its meaning. That to claim the right or the, the claim the ability to do something first because you said it first is a reflection of our sinful, selfish nature. I find it hard sometimes when I'm driving, especially in town, and uh, I want to get to where I want to be, and uh, I'm driving along, and just sometimes to allow someone out of a junction, because my anxiety is that they will gain an advantage at the traffic light and I will be the loser and they will gain at my expense. We're selfish by nature. During the American Revolution, Peter Miller was a Baptist pastor who lived in, in Pennsylvania and he was a personal friend of George Washington. Now in the town that he lived, there was also a, a, a rascal of a man. His name was Michael Whit Whitman and he was evil-minded and did everything that he could to oppose and humiliate the pastor. Now, one day, Michael Whitman was arrested for treason and sentenced to die. Now, his adversary, the person whose life he's tried to make a misery, uh, Peter, M Peter Miller, s traveled 70 miles on foot to Philadelphia to plead for the life of the traitor. George Washington says, no, Peter, you, I will not spare the life of your friend. I will not grant him a pardon. My friend, said Peter to George Washington, he's the bitterest enemy that I have. Washington said this, you have walked 70 miles to save the life of an enemy. That puts everything in a different light and in the end. He granted a pardon and those two men walked back to their town together, no longer enemies, but friends. But what does it look like for me to love? What does it look like for you to love? What does it look like? Uh, Paul David Tripp, in, uh, in one of his writings, gives some very helpful, I found them very helpful images uh, of what love is. Love is this, first thing. Being willing to have your life complicated by the needs and the struggles of others without impatience or anger. Love is making a daily commitment to resist the needless moments of conflict that come from pointing out and responding to minor offenses or feeling the need to be always right. Love is being unwilling to do what is wrong when you've been wronged, but looking for ways to come overcome evil with good. Love is willing to always ask for forgiveness and always being committed to grant forgiveness when it is requested. Love is being unwilling to flatter, to lie, to manipulate, or to deceive another person into giving, giving you what you want or doing something your way. Love is staying faithful to your commitment to treat others with respect and grace, even in moments when the other person is undeserving. Love is refusing to be self-focused or demanding, but instead looking for specific ways to help, to serve, to support and encourage even when we are busy or tired. These three things remain, Paul says. Faith, hope and love. But he says, but the greatest 
of these is love. Why is love greater than faith and hope? Good question. Love is greater than faith and, and hope in that both faith and hope depend on love for their existence. You see, without love, there can be no true faith. A loveless faith is nothing but an empty religious exercise. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2. He says, if I have faith, if I have big faith, faith that I can move mountains, but do not love, I am nothing. In fact, he says, I am nothing more than a tinkling cymbal and a sounding gong. Without love, there can be no genuine hope because a loveless hope is a contradiction because we cannot truly hope for something that we do not love. You see, faith and hope are dead. They're sterile things if they are not accompanied by love. But the greatest of these is love. Philippians 1 verse 9, Paul prays for the Philippian believers and says this, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and in all discernment. These three things remain, but the greatest of these is love. And my prayer for all of us is that we would grow in love and that it may abound and it might be at that magnetic force that believers, non-believers would come, would trust Jesus and be saved. This is the most convincing argument that Jesus is authentic. This is our witness that we love one another. So let's love one another as we have been encouraged. Just to you.